Today, our students Rochelle and Maya return to the show for episode three of our fieldwork series. They are currently in week five out of the 12 total weeks of their first level two fieldwork rotation. Being almost halfway done, the students are definitely starting to feel stretched and pushed out of their comfort zones with the increasing demands and stress of their expectations and caseloads. If you haven't listened to the first two episodes in the fieldwork series, feel free to go back and listen to episode four and episode six to hear all about how they started and their experiences during the first couple weeks of fieldwork. If you want to continue the discussion, you can join our Facebook group or follow us on Instagram or Twitter. Hope you enjoy the show. If you're interested in occupational therapy, this is the place for you. This show aims to explore our profession by sharing who we are and what we do. Because for us, occupational therapy is more than just a job. Hi, I'm Sarah. Welcome to OT for Life. It is great to be back, and I'm so excited for episode three with my awesome friends, Maya and Rochelle. Welcome back to the show, guys. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks. And I actually have a special treat for you guys because I asked my students for a couple questions of what they would want to ask you guys and kind of hear the questions that they're thinking about that they'd want to hear from other people that are going through the same experience. And so what I was thinking is we'll, we'll kind of start with one of their questions. And what they wanted to know is if you guys could kind of explain what your daily and weekly responsibilities are as of this week. For this, this is Maya, by the way. (laughs) For this week, my responsibilities are um, I am treating for eight kiddos. So that's eight hours of treating. Um, I have, it takes me about an hour to come up with a treatment plan. That's kind of the level that I'm at right now where it takes me a little bit of time to come up with a treatment plan. I I run the session. Um, My supervisor is watching me. Then she gives me feedback afterwards. I have to write the note after the session, and that takes me some time, too. And um, lastly, I have to do a post-treatment reflection for every single session that I do. So with all of that combined, it takes about like three hours to work on one session. So that's kind of what my week looks like. I am waking up early. I'm having difficulty sleeping. Because I'm thinking about treatment plans and I just have so much on my mind. So that's what my week looks like right now. Do you feel like you have adequate time within the day? I mean, if you're seeing eight kiddos and you're saying a day and you're saying, no. No, oh, total. Total for In the a week. whole week. Huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. And then I totally, totally misheard that. And I was no, like, for the whole week. Where is, where's her <laughs> day going? <laughs> Okay, so so eight for the week, three, two, two to three a day. Yeah, roughly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wow. So it's not so, it's like, not so crazy I'm, right now. Um, but I have with my um, at my site we have a lot of outside assignments to do, and that I think is what's taking up a lot of my time. So finding research articles and um, doing working on my case study. There's a lot of time that I'm putting into field work, whether it's like actually running a session or doing like doing activities or assignments outside of treating. Okay. Mm-hmm. So during the day, do you feel like you have adequate time or are you finding that you're struggling during the day to get things done and then also having to work in the morning and the uh, evenings? I think during the day I have enough time, but what is getting to me is the fact that I, I basically find out my caseload for the following week every Monday. So with that in mind, I work throughout the week to treatment plan for the following week on top of already kind of working on and like tweaking my sessions mm-hmm. for, for the day. So I kind of wake up early and I work on my treatment plans for the following week, but I also try to perfect the treatment plans for like that day. And like, okay, this is what I need. I'm finding all my materials. And so that is kind of the tough part because I'm not just thinking about today. I'm thinking right. about like every day. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel like, and Rochelle, we'll get, we'll get to you. <laughs> but do you feel like you're getting added stress because you have both of those? Like, cause I feel like it can go either way. Like I, I feel like your supervisors are probably saying, Hey, if we tell her a week in advance, she has more time. But do you feel like by having multiple things that you're thinking about, it's a little more stressful? I think so. Okay. I think so. Because when I write up my treatment plans, 
I don't necessarily think about all the logistics and all of like the materials that I need. And that's something that I run through that morning on top of already like working on another treatment plan for the following week. So I think that it kind of is like a double stressor. Yeah. 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 Huh. And I, I feel like some people that probably would work really well for because yeah. they want to plan ahead. Yeah. But like other people, they're like, all right, just tell me what, what my responsibility is this week or, or this, week this or day today. Or yeah. <laughs> something like that. I'll focus on that and then I'll, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll get to the next one. Yeah. That's interesting. I think that's kind of unique in how they do that. Yeah. Huh. All right. Mm-hmm. Rochelle, where are you at? Um, so currently I am up to five patients per day that I'm treating and I don't know what that breaks down to weekly, um, like 25. (laughs) Um, yeah. So basically I, I get all my patients for the next week on Fridays and then I have kind of the weekend and I try to plan as much as I can. I usually don't get through a ton. I usually get through kind of like Monday and half of Tuesday over the weekend. Then I kind of struggle to keep up the rest of the week. I found that definitely happened this week. Um, And then I'm responsible for writing all the notes for all the treatment sessions. And then the day after those treatment sessions, I'll get like, I'll get corrections on my notes that I'm, so the next day I'm responsible for revising the previous day's notes, running that, the sessions for the day and writing the notes for the day. So it kind of keeps kind of building up throughout the week. Monday, I mean, Mondays I get my Friday notes to revise, but mm-hmm. it feels like I've plan- I've gotten like the weekend to plan and kind of come up with more ideas. But as the week goes on, I feel like I'm staying up later and later because I've gotten less done as the week's gotten busier. So when you say that you're, you're given your... Uh, your caseload on Friday Mm -hmm. for the following week. Yep. Is that Friday morning? Is that Friday afternoon? It's Friday afternoon. So after I'm done treating for the week and then I get kind of like a week week in review about Mm -hmm. how the week went and like notes from every from each treatment session that I ran and then I get my caseload for the next week. Do you feel like you are spending most of your weekend preparing for the next week? Yeah, I feel like I'm spending pretty, I pretty much have gotten down to spending Saturday mornings till about noon. I try to do something other than field work on Saturday afternoons. And then I kind of feel like I spend all day Sunday preparing, preparing. Yeah. Okay. I feel like that's a shift from what you were doing. Cause weren't you doing like working Saturdays and then taking Sundays off? I feel like you were doing that a couple weeks ago. I don't know. I think I've been... I don't even remember anymore. <laughs> well, I'm just I'm trying, back and <laughs> figuring out what's going on, yeah. But so that's kind of what I've been doing, trying to plan as much as I can in advance. I feel like that definitely helps me kind of get a little bit ahead if I can get more in advance. And since sometimes I've been getting a couple of the same people, it's nice because anything I over-prepare, I can kind of carry over to the next mm-hmm. session. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's gotten a little easier, but still pretty difficult overall. It's, it's a lot of people. I don't really, and I only kind of have outside assignments more so, like on that Friday, I'll, I'll get assignments for next week. So for example, it'd be like manual muscle testing and range of motion was the first week. Then, you know, we'll talk about sensory testing this week or my assignment now is looking at vision screening or vision kind of assessments that we can do that we'll talk about kind of whenever we have a cancellation the next week. Those are kind of my like weekly assignments of reviewing. And then I'm also expected to work with patients outside of their treatment sessions to like practice some of those skills. My assignments are very like in depth. Like for example, one of my assignments was basically writing up all of the like items in the gym so like all of the swings and like different items that can be used for obstacle courses and then finding out like writing out all of the uses for every single like item so like for the lycra swing this can be used for like proprioceptive input for to increase like body awareness like basically writing out a description of what every item could be used for like those are my type of assignments Mm -hmm. and that's like I'll get like three of those during the week so I have a lot yeah so I'm like always working wow (laughs) <laughs> I know you had mentioned uh, in one of our previous meetings of that there are other students with you. Yes. Are you guys all doing the exact same assignments or do you get like portions <laughs> of it that you get to work collaborate, collaboratively yeah. with? So we meet once a week um, and we have our own assignments as well, but I get separate assignments from my supervisor. So like it's like the weekly assignments from just like the, the group mm-hmm. and then my weekly assignments from my supervisor 
and then like my treatment plans. So it's a lot. Okay. <laughs> so even though I don't have that many children right now, I do have like a lot of outside work that I'm always doing. I feel mm-hmm. like I'm always working. Do you think that they'll give you less projects as your caseload increases? I hope so. <laughs> I'm just curious. I don't know. If... <laughs> and if they don't, I will ask. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious just because I know that you said there's students that are at different weeks yeah. than you. So I was wondering maybe they had some insight or they yeah. told you maybe, oh, the as you get more kids, you have less projects. So the workload kind of evens out. I think yeah. it just depends on who your supervisor is or mm-hmm. your, your field work um, educator. And mine, she likes... She gives me a lot of work. <laughs> Are the other students having individual assignments from their supervisor as well? Yes. Okay. But from what I've heard, it's not like a big deal. Mm, okay. Yeah. So yours is a little a bit more deal. busy yeah. work. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like, I mean, the theme of the theme of the episode is probably that mm-hmm. you guys have a lot going on. Okay. Yeah. But I'm really trying to kind of pull out some similarities, but also some differences of, of your experiences. And Rochelle, it kind of sounds like you have more treatment hours mm-hmm. and and notes and that kind of stuff. And with Maya, it sounds like you have a lot more assignments and kind of busy work of all this stuff with a little bit of treatment and some treatment planning and all of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I guess one thing that stands out to me that would be really helpful is the assignment where you had to go through the list of the equipment. While it does seem like busy work, it's kind of is just like a big idea list for you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So if you have this on this Word doc and you're thinking, oh, for this kid, I really need to work on proprioceptive input, type it in, search, oh, boom, 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 boom. here's all these these things that I can do right there for yeah. you. That's one thing that you maybe you could use as like a tool later. Yeah, but, mm-hmm. I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think like in, in my mind, I'm still like, well, there's other students there. Like that would be a great thing for you guys all to work on together yeah. and really kind of uh, kind of crowdsource all that information and then <laughs> build on like you might come up with three activities mm-hmm. and, you know, somebody else might come up with 10 other activities yeah. for the same thing. So that is a great part about having other students there is that we basically started a Google Doc with all of our treatment plans. So like, okay, this is week five. I'll put up my week five stuff. They'll put up their week five stuff and we get to go through and like figure out what we can use and like fine tune for our That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. How beneficial is that? Yeah, it's really great. And there are seven of us. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that, that really helps. Yeah. Lots yeah. Of ideas. yeah. But I wouldn't, I, I'm not suspecting that you guys share any of the kiddos, right? No. Yeah. Okay. So it's no. not like, oh, well, how did it go? No, it's not like, how did it go the same thing? Like, no, no, no. <laughs> huh. All right. Well, I feel like we kind of talked about the challenges of, you mm-hmm. know, really what's going on. What do you guys think, you know, now that we're five weeks in, what's been getting easier? Or has anything been getting easier? Definitely, like, manual muscle testing has been getting a lot easier for me. Um, In class, when we practiced, we kind of just watched a video on how to do it and practice on people that had five out of five for their scores for every muscle. So getting a feel for, okay, so they can move this far with against gravity, so now okay, I need to test them in a gravity eliminated position. You know what I'm saying? Like going through that reasoning process of doing manual muscle testing for sure. And also practical skills in terms of transfers and like maneuvering with people, different wheelchairs. I mean, everybody that comes into the clinic, you know, whether they have a a stroke or a spinal cord injury, all these wheelchairs are different. They have different parts that move in different ways and you have to push different buttons (laughs) and no two wheelchairs are the same. (laughs) At least I haven't encountered it. So kind of getting the hang of like maneuvering different things Mm -hmm. or looking in the right place for different buttons or offloading somebody's weight to pull out a a different, you know, some sort Mm -hmm. of component that's getting in the way of a certain activity. So I think that's getting a little bit easier just as I get more practice and familiarity Mm -hmm. with people. And even though, you know, it's different wheelchairs and different diagnoses and different people, mm-hmm. the what kind of sticks out to me is that it, it's kind of a similar mindset with manual muscle testing and with transfers of, like, mm-hmm. how to go about it. Mm-hmm. Yes, you might make accommodations and you might move a person slightly different mm-hmm. based on size, based on, you mm-hmm. know, function mm-hmm. level. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, you're, you're following kind of this structure in your head yeah. of, like, what to do. Mm-hmm. So... Do you feel like that's just because you're, it's 
repetitive, you know, and mm-hmm. you're getting more experience. Yeah, getting more practice to it. it. Yeah, definitely just by getting more practice with it. And I guess I would say, a, I think I have a little bit different opinion about kind of the, it being the same. I think that manual muscle testing for somebody that's had a spinal cord injury versus somebody that's had a stroke versus somebody that's had a traumatic brain injury can kind of look different based yeah. on tone and spasticity and other things like that too. So I do think it kind of, you kind of have to shift your mind just a little Mm -hmm. bit to work through that. So it does, you kind of have to shift. It's not, it's not all the same, like kind of run through. Right. So you kind of have to practice it within each kind of category. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like mm-hmm. close enough, oh, yeah. like you, yeah. can, you like still you said category, you right? Know, so you yeah. still mm-hmm. have X amount of clients that are kind of in this similar category, right? And you know, like that. Yeah, that's also you know mm-hmm. pediatric brain over here where <laughs> I don't really deal with any of that. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what about you, Maya? Um, I think one thing that has gotten easier for me is speaking with parents. Mm-hmm. In the beginning, I kind of thought to myself, like, do I know what to say to them? Do I know what I'm doing? Like, can I explain <laughs> this to them? But now I feel like it's not that difficult. And it's like, it's working out for me. But I've also not had like a difficult situation. Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought I was going to be more nervous. And it kind of just seems to flow. And it just comes out. And they understand what I'm talking about. And it seems to be going well. <laughs> Can you explain um, a little bit of like how that looks? Are you talking to them before the session, as you're working with the child, at the end, a little bit of both? Yeah. So a lot of the a lot of uh, my kiddos, their parents don't sit in the session. So okay. we have ten minutes allotted in our hour to speak with the parents after. So I basically will just say like today went really well. We worked on some like strengthening activities. We did a really cool activity like kicking a bowling pin and kicking a bowling ball and knocking down pins. And that was helping with core strength that could eventually help with his posture so he can like don his socks with two hands without having to like lean over and like use one hand and like hold himself up with the other. So I feel like it just kind of comes out and I mm-hmm. kind of just know what I'm talking about. And I didn't think at first that I would know what I was talking about. <laughs> and now is this just for the kids that you are leading the session or do you have to do this with all the sessions? No, just for the kids that I'm leading the okay. sessions with. Yeah. Okay. So mm-hmm. ones that you're familiar with. Yeah. Because I, I, I do think, and, and I've seen this kind of over the years with my students of when they first have to start talking clinically Mm -hmm. to the parents. Like some of my students, they'll talk to the parents and they'll talk about whatever. But when it comes to actually explaining like what they, what they're doing, what they're working on, that can be really, really hard. Yeah. You yourself are still trying to figure that out. Yes. And then you're like, did I do it right? Well, I don't know if I did it right, but I did it. Yeah. You know, and now, <laughs> now we have to talk about it. Do, I, you, do you feel any of that kind of? Yeah, I try to just stick to what I know. So, like, I know for sure <laughs> this works on this. So, let's talk about that. And there are also some functional goals because um, at my site we work on um, ADL. So, to say today we worked on buttoning and she was able to button two with minimal assistance for me. Like just like giving Mm -hmm. like actual like functional goals because that's something that they're working on at home is like easy to talk about as well because they know exactly what you're talking Mm -hmm. about as opposed to saying like we got some proprioceptive input and that really helped with Mm self-regulation. That's kind of like, what are you talking about? So I think it helps that a lot of the goals for the children are functional and that helps a lot. Okay. With talking to parents and having yeah. them kind of like understand what you're saying. Yeah. Any tough questions from them yet? I know you said it, nothing's been difficult, but any, any, anything that's really made you kind of think that you were like, oh, okay, hold on. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. <laughs> and when that happens, I might say like, I, I'm not sure. I'll ask and then I'll re- like mm-hmm. refer to or defer my question to my supervisor mm-hmm. and see. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or you just say, you know what? That is a fantastic question. <laughs> um, I'm going to go look that up and we'll chat a little bit more about this mm-hmm. okay. next time, either next week or, you know, if they're twice a week and you're seeing them later in the week. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. you, you never, like, even once you guys aren't students and you're clinicians, you never have to be expected to know everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of highlight a story. This was, gosh, this was in the first couple of years of me practicing. And I remember this parent came to me, a lovely parent, like we had a great relationship. And she comes and she asks me about some acronym. Mm-hmm. And I sat there and I froze. I'd never heard it before. 
And I was, you know, quite honestly, like appalled with myself that I didn't know what it was. And she said it just so, like so matter of fact that I was like, I don't know what this is. And so I, I don't remember what I said to her in the moment. I probably just, I don't know. Hold on. <laughs> and so I like went and talked to my boss at the time and I was like, oh, can you tell me a little bit more about whatever it was that this client had told me. And my boss at the time was like, I have no idea what that is either. (laughs) And so here I was like thinking I should have known what it was. And then I go to my boss expecting her to know. And Mm -hmm. she's like, I don't know, look it up. And I was like, okay. She's basically, she's the one that told me like, don't expect yourself to know everything. Mm -hmm. If somebody asks you a question, just say, great question. I'll get back to you with an answer because I don't know at the moment. You know, and that's yeah. as a student, as a clinician, like perfectly acceptable response mm-hmm. to have. Mm-hmm. I feel like in working with adults, it's a little different because they're they're there for the session and they can they'll ask you questions right then and there. Oh, what's this? Or oh, I'm having trouble. I'm having a lot of trouble with shaving, and I can say, oh well, what's the trouble? Or <laughs> what's what's the problem? Or to kind of walk me through how you do it. Kind of this week, I've been able to do that a little bit more and come up with maybe one suggestion or, oh, maybe you could try using a built-up handle since you can't grip it as well or you don't have the the grip to grab Mm -hmm. it, you know, kind of something like that. Like it's too thin thin of a utensil or whatever. But then kind of having to like think on the spot when people come with problems and but then being able to just say, okay, well, how about you bring, tell me what your issues are, what the barriers are to you um, completing this, and then how about you bring it in next time and we'll work on it then. So that is that does get kind of tricky. I'm sure kids maybe have things they want to work on too, but adults definitely are like, I want this to be, I want to do this, I want to do this, this is giving me trouble, what do I do? So it's kind of hard sometimes. I, I mean, I can, I can totally agree. And I, mm-hmm. I still get it to this day where people are like, oh, well, this is going on, you know, a, a parent or a mm-hmm. caregiver. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, hold on. Like, I've never seen your child do this before. Walk me through specifically mm-hmm. what's happening mm-hmm. and ask for as much detail as you possibly can. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, and some of this might be able to be apl- uh, applicable. Some of it might not be, but a lot of times I'm like, take a picture of it, take a video of it happening. If it's something that you can't replicate in the clinic mm-hmm. or in the facility, mm-hmm. take a video of it happening so I could be there. Mm-hmm. Cause I really want to know exactly what's going on. Cause if it's This, I might give you a different reason as opposed to if it's something completely different, Mm -hmm. I might give you another strategy for that. That's really, that's really good advice because even just this week, somebody was having trouble. They wanted to do kind of like a knitting sort of activity and they were telling me that it was difficult for this reason and I had her bring it in. And when I was watching her, the difficulty she was describing was a little, it wasn't what I was expecting. And so then I was kind of trying to help her with different strategies to make it go smoother. So I thought that worked out really well. But if it's something, I don't know, like shaving that you don't want to bring in and do it in the clinic, um, then that would work a lot better. That's a good Mm -hmm. tip. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, especially Mm -hmm. in the adult population, you know, you'll get people that want to be taking selfies and, you know, (laughs) they're going to pull out their GoPro or whatever. And like, you know, they're, they're going to want to show you because, Mm -hmm. Once you guys enter into, hey, I'm here to help you, mm-hmm. they're going to say, all right, here, here's my problems. Mm-hmm. Here's what's going on. This is what's difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the more that you can see it and, and see it actually in context, you know, I think mm-hmm. that's really important kind of going back to the roots of occupational therapy, seeing it in context, not mm-hmm. in a sterile environment mm-hmm. where they're performing it in front of somebody. Right. It's like, okay, we'll use the shaving example. Like, well, what does your bathroom look like? Or are you Mm -hmm. in the bathroom? Are you in, you know, are you somewhere else like Mm -hmm. in in another mirror? What does that whole environment also play a fact in Mm -hmm. or play a role into how they're able to kind of carry out that task? Yeah. Yeah. It felt really, it felt really OT to do, to do that kind of activity. That's something that was really important to her that was working on finger coordination and kind of fine motor skills. And so that was that felt really OT and felt good. <laughs> uh, you're talking about the knitting? The knitting I, I, that we did today, yeah. Can I ask you, do you have any history, uh, any exposure, of any experience with knitting? No. <laughs> yeah. No, we brought it. She kind of, she came in. I asked her to show me, kind of explain to me, what are you doing? Can you mm-hmm. show me a little bit? And then I was kind of able to offer some suggestions where I saw, where I saw it. I was, it was kind of like a little mini activity analysis and then... 
intervening with what I could, it's still kind of in the back of my mind, like thinking of different things. Like if something comes to my mind that way, next time I see her, I can say, Hey, I just thought of this. Why don't you try this Mm -hmm. at home and Mm -hmm. see how that goes? So I I heard a quote and I can't remember. I can't remember. I just heard it the other day. Um, But they were talking about how occupational therapy, a lot of people are like, Oh, well, it's the jack of all trades. But Then I heard it's not the jack of all trades, it's the jack of the trade. Basically saying that we we might not know everything, Mm -hmm. but we're going to figure out how to do everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, I mean, that just, as you were talking, that just kind of jumped into my mind. And it's like, I had a feeling you didn't have any experience in knitting. Uh, Mm -hmm. I mean... I don't, you know, so if I was put in that situation. (laughs) But again, activity analysis, you can look at the structures, what's going on. You can look at the the activity, the demands, and then either help strengthen or make accommodations in order to accomplish what it is Mm -hmm. so they can do what they want. Yep. And it's fun. (laughs) And it's fun and it's something new and it's not the things that you just have in the clinic. You know what I mean? It's something they brought from home. They clearly are invested. They want to do it. They like it. It's something new. It kind of changes it up. It's fun. And I think too, you also get that buy-in to the therapy Oh, totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally. Where it's like, yeah, you can give them some finger exercises or tell them to use the The putty or putty. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like that, it's like, okay. But once you connect it to something functional, Mm -hmm. something purposeful, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're like, wait, you're going to help me be able to do that skill. Yep. I'm in. Exactly. Like, let's figure this out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You find a lot of times people, when you ask them, oh, how's your home exercise program going? Oh, uh, well, I do it here and there. Oh, what does that mean? Mm, maybe once a week. You know what I'm saying? People, mm-hmm. A lot of times people don't really carry over with exercises or putty or whatever. But this woman, for example, I know that she likes to do this activity. I know she's going to do it at least three or four days of the week. She told She told me that, you know, maybe almost every day she'll sit there and do it for a little bit. While she's watching TV or sitting talking with family or whatever, you know. So you know that she's going to keep doing it because it's something she likes to do, not like another chore Mm -hmm. on the list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not in addition to, it's I'm doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And better. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Or more efficiently or Mm -hmm. to a better standard or whatever they're thinking about. So I kind of want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the supervisory process and really specifically about communication because throughout field work communication is key and even outside of being a student in the workforce communication is so so important but really right now I think as the demands are increasing the stress levels increasing uh, I think it's so important to really kind of have that communication piece would you guys you know feel okay kind of sharing a little bit about what the communication with your supervisor, uh, other professionals, and the other students, and kind of what it's looking like in your setting right now. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so throughout the week, I have um, a little bit of time to talk to my supervisor every day. Um, In the mornings, we meet for about 15 minutes to kind of talk about the day, um, and then we have our weekly reviews on Fridays. Um, And I kind of noticed that I needed a little bit more time to communicate with her and to ask more questions um, because there were kind of some gaps that I was having trouble bridging or filling in. And so I kind of this past week have really tried to take it upon myself to ask more questions. You know, anytime we have a cancellation, instead of just going off to go document my notes, getting those questions answered in the moment so that I can use that knowledge kind of throughout the rest of the day and throughout the week has been really beneficial. I know that I don't really have a jump start on my notes like I would want, but I think that it's kind of more important at this stage to be just asking more questions before it's kind of too late or before I make a mistake or some or have some sort of misconception. But yeah, that's kind of what, where how much communication we get throughout the day. Our clients are always back to back to back to back to back. So mm-hmm. there's not really that time unless we do have somebody that cancels where I can ask those kind of questions. Mm -hmm. We do have people that cancel pretty frequently. So it does, it usually there's a cancellation probably at least every other day. Okay. So I think it's great that you really came to that realization of I need this. And so I'm going to, I'm going to try, you know, Mm -hmm. and and really take that initiative to start asking questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cause I, I think in kind of one of the the other meetings we were talking about where you were feeling that you weren't getting enough feedback, you know, that you Mm -hmm. wanted to have a little bit more communication with your supervisor and 
I can only imagine how fast paced both of your days are. I know how mine are. So I I totally get it. And it's like, you have a question, you want to ask it. And if you don't ask it, then all of a sudden you've seen six more clients and you're like, well, I don't know what that question was that I really wanted to ask you back then. Or it's mm-hmm. like, well, now I have five others that I really need to ask you that are more important. Right. So really asking those questions to guide that clinical reasoning mm-hmm. in the moment. I, I, I think that's so important. I think that's mm-hmm. a super important uh, mm-hmm. strategy yeah. for other students that might be having similar issues or might yeah. be looking for more feedback. Yeah. And I kind of would notice... And I kind of try to communicate this with my um, instructor as well, that I noticed that throughout the week, I kind of was getting the same feedback. That's why I kind of have taken the initiative so that I can keep improving throughout the week instead of kind of staying at that static level and waiting till the end. Because Mm -hmm. I found that throughout multiple treatment sessions with people, you know, if I was doing one thing with someone and I kind of would continue it, continue it if it wasn't a clear Mm -hmm problem or clear safety concern. Do do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe I was tapping something or facilitating something when I was trying to relax a muscle and then the feedback would be kind of the same throughout the week. So that's kind of why I've been really just trying to ask those questions as quickly as I can or, you know, as quickly after the session as Mm -hmm. I can to learn for the next day. I think too, it's also helping you not second guess yourself. Right. Building on something strong that you are sure in. Right. Rather than, well, I did this and I didn't get feedback on it. Not sure if it's right or wrong. Okay, I'm gonna continue. You know, now it's like, no, we're 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 squashing anything that might have been uh counterindicative or anything like that. Right. And only moving forward with those strong points. Mm -hmm. Can I ask how receptive or, or how you feel your supervisor has been with you asking more questions, taking a little bit more time out of her routine, out of her schedule. Mm-hmm. How, how do you feel like that's, you, you mentioned it just happened this week. So it's still kind of a new thing. I guess I was also doing it last week as well okay. too. Um, but I think that, I don't, I think that she's pretty receptive to most of my questions. I think that she likes that I'm asking questions to her whenever I can. And I think that it's not taking too much time out of her day because she's not planning for every single person. I have kind of half the caseload Mm -hmm. so she can kind of afford a Mm -hmm. little bit of that time to answer questions. So I don't think that she's put off by it or anything. I think it works out well, actually. Good. Uh Um, For me, it's kind of similar. In the beginning, I, I found myself observing a lot and taking notes of each session And not necessarily asking the questions that I had because I had a lot of questions and I kind of thought maybe I'm supposed to know this already or maybe that might be like a dumb question. And and so I would know the child's goals and I would just assume, okay, well, I know they need to work on bilateral coordination or by manual use of the hands. Maybe that's why she's doing this. And so. I would write my notes because she um, I asked if I could write notes from the beginning just to like side by side so we can Mm -hmm. compare ours. And I would write my notes and kind of just assume throughout, like, okay, I think therapist provided this for the for X, Y, and Z. And I found that that doesn't really work. So it actually was this week that I decided to ask all of my questions on the spot. And so, and I have my little tiny notebook with me and I, instead of assuming, I would say, are you doing this for this reason? Hmm. Or why Why are you, why um, were we giving her bounces at first? And why now are you asking her to bounce herself? Like I'm asking all of these questions because I'm like, wait, I really need to know what is going on. <laughs> and I kind of do, but I really need to know. So like I'm asking all the questions on the spot. The only time that I'm not is for like the older kiddos who understand and know that we're talking about them. So like I write them down and I ask right after like while we're cleaning up after the session I'll ask like Mm -hmm. every single question that I have and I'm like why didn't I do this from the beginning (laughs) (laughs) that's exactly what I was just gonna ask if if you could go if you could put yourself back into day one yeah would do you wish that you were asking the questions on the spot or do you feel like you needed that time to kind of hash it out on your own I feel like it did help me to work it out on my own, but maybe I should have started sooner because it is really helpful to know exactly why Mm -hmm. she's doing what she's doing. And then she will even, and then even the more engaged 
engaged I am, the more engaged she'll become. And she'll say like, see, look at his response right now. Look at how he is versus how he was two seconds ago before he bounced himself on the swing or she's like giving me more too. So <laughs> I'm finding that that's like super helpful. How do you feel? I'm, I'm, I'm going now to the kind of that receptive piece mm-hmm. of it. Do you feel like uh, that your supervisor was open to you asking questions and you just didn't ask them? Or do you did you ever feel like, oh, I just can't because she wasn't giving you that vibe? Yeah. In the beginning, she um, did ask me to write down my questions and talk about it either for our meeting, which is once a week, or to email them at the end of the day. Okay. And I find that that's really hard because I might want to say, why did you do that exact thing right now? <laughs> and, you know, and that's hard to replicate or like remind mm-hmm. her at the end of the day. So mm-hmm. I really took it upon myself to just ask them. And if she thinks it's too much, then she'll tell me, but she hasn't. And she's okay. been answering the questions. And so I'm just going for it and mm-hmm. seeing how she responds. But she seems to be like very receptive and yeah, it's working out. <laughs> I, I kind of think what you guys are saying, this this kind of ties into learning styles, you know, mm-hmm. and different learning styles and maybe different teaching styles compared to student and supervisor. And what it sounds like is that you guys, again, took the initiative and are really kind of advocating for yourselves of what you need, even though they might have been like, hey, we're only going to talk about it once a week Mm -hmm. or email it to me later. Mm -hmm. Sometimes right then or right after the session is the best time Mm -hmm. to, to really kind of get these ideas out before Mm -hmm. something else pops into your mind. I'd love to discuss a little bit about kind of expectations and expectations you guys might have for yourselves, Mm -hmm. as well as maybe the demands that are being put on you from your supervisor and the facility. Mm -hmm. And has, has there been an experience that's kind of stood out to you that you really kind of had to advocate for yourself? Yeah, so um, recently I had an experience where I'm given my caseload for the following week on Mondays. So this past Monday, I was told that for the following week, my caseload will double, but my um, treatment plans are, I'm given less time to turn in my treatment plans. And that really stressed me out. And I really thought to myself, okay, like, I don't know if I'm ready for this. So I, even though I was like very nervous to do this, I emailed um, my supervisor back and basically told her I did not necessarily feel the best about doubling my caseload at the point that I'm at right now. This is my first level two and I fear that I will be putting out work that's not quality. And I just ask if there's any way to either extend my treatment when my treatment plans are due or to lessen the caseload. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) she said yes. (laughs) Nice. Yeah, she said yes. So she said you can keep with your old date of uh, your old due date. And she took away three kids for my caseload for next week. So it was like a breath. It was like amazing. And I thought to myself, like, I'm so thankful that I did that because if I didn't, I would have just been extremely stressed and just, you know, we're a part of this too. And we have a say so in what we're okay with and what we're not. Mm -hmm. And I think it is important to say how you feel regardless of if you get the results you want or not. So I'm grateful that she like listened to me and and understood that I was feeling a little bit overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So. Was that, um, cause I know in the beginning, you know, you guys are given, uh, what do you call it? Not a syllabus, but like the objectives, objectives, uh-huh. the weekly objectives. Yeah. Is, did it actually in there double from week five to week six? I'd be curious. I no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It did not, no. Because <laughs> I was like, that seems like a really big jump. I'm, yeah. That doesn't seem right. And yeah. if that's what they expect, it, it should be in there. So you you so know, I know from that moment. <laughs> yeah. But that's just beautiful right there of, of really... I'm sure it was nerve wracking to have to respond and say, hey, this is too much for me. But to have her respond in a positive manner and really listen to you. Like, that's huge. Yeah. I'm proud of you. Thank you. That's good. (laughs) That's really good. What about you, Rochelle? Anything you want to share about any sort of challenges with communication or expectations or anything of that matter? Yeah. So I kind of had um, a little bit of a different experience. I kind of came forward during one of my weekly meetings and said that I felt pretty overwhelmed um, from the past week, and I was wondering if I could kind of stick at the number that I was treating at for the first half of this, the next week and then increase to the new number by the end of the week. And I kind of got back a, a response saying that, oh, this is kind of, this is where you're expected to be based on the objective. So 
uh, you can do it kind of thing. And Mm so I was left feeling a little bit unheard, but hoping that maybe it was kind of also a comp having confidence in me that I could do it. And I did do it, but I definitely felt stressed throughout the week. And when you're trying to be creative, making all these different treatment ideas, and you're trying to find articles that has, you know, for research that supports different interventions for all these people, and then, you know, switching between all these really complicated um, neurodiagnoses, it kind of all just gets in this big, I don't know what you would want to call it, but it kind of makes your mind just kind of jump all over the place and try to think about too many things at once. Mm -hmm. Um, But it definitely, I guess it just has made me think that, you know, I need to say, maybe just keep saying it again or kind of find the root of maybe one thing that's overwhelming to me and coming back with more solutions or more options. That way it's not Mm -hmm. a yes or no, maybe saying, oh, could I do this or this, you know, kind of giving a choice or kind of coming at it from a different approach so that Mm -hmm. I can get a little bit of like a meeting in the middle sort of situation. But yeah. And and I think so far we've really just been talking about like your relationship, your communication with the supervisor, Mm -hmm. but let's, let's kind of go outside. Let's go a little bit more global right now. Um, You know, we have, we have two fantastic examples of one going well and one going maybe not as well as we would hope that it would go. What what have you done or what could you do um, outside of just going to your supervisor? Do you guys feel like there are other resources that, that you guys can go to? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I definitely, um, I feel like the staff at in my program at the school has been super supportive during this kind of time. I've reached out to multiple professors and the fieldwork coordinator. Um, The fieldwork coordinator I reached out to about the specific situation. She kind of helped me to reframe kind of my thinking and asked me like, oh, were you assuming this? Or kind of gave me a couple ideas of experiences that other students have had and kind of a strategy of you need to kind of adapt your to this person's style in order to do well. And then the different professors that I've reached out to have been really good and they've kind of been able to help talk me through different questions that I have had and direct me towards some resources. I've reached out to a couple um, that kind of specialize in different um, diagnoses. So Mm -hmm. that's been super helpful. And I would definitely say to the, any students going through this to call or to email your professors because they've all come back with, here's my cell phone number, call me whenever you want. And I've talked to them for 45 minutes to an hour. And wow. it's it's been great. So they're, mm-hmm. and I've said to them that I'm so thankful for how supportive they are. And they said, well, if it weren't for you, we wouldn't have a job. So, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like right. they're, they're so open to it. And they uh-huh. say, call me anytime, like anytime you need. So that's mm-hmm. been really great. And I think the important part about that, especially reaching out to professors that have had you in class, is they know you personally Mm -hmm. and they know your strengths and they know your weaknesses. So when you come to them and you say, hey, like this is happening, they're going to have a good idea. Like, okay, Mm -hmm. maybe it's something that you need to work on, Mm -hmm. you know, or maybe it's something that isn't specifically you it it is the communication piece it is the expectation piece it's it's something that's outside of that Mm -hmm. Uh uh-huh yeah to even just to have somebody to kind of validate and say oh that is kind of that is difficult or oh that is quite a bit of people to have for you know being your first year and where you're at and any all the other factors saying that is pretty difficult and then also to have somebody to say I know that you can do this. I have a really good feeling Mm -hmm. about this. You got this. It's going to be great. You're going to get through it. Just like keep going and call me anytime. Like that's really nice Mm -hmm. to have someone to say that, Mm -hmm. you know, that's no, that knows you, like you said, from class and knows your strengths and just somebody that's kind of like rooting for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have really been reaching out to a lot of the other OTs at my site. There are so many (laughs) and I just like introduced myself to everyone like, hi, you know, (laughs) And just ask them any questions that I have. And I feel comfortable doing that because I don't know. I just feel comfortable and they've given me a lot of tools and like resources and like just like ideas. And I feel like that's really helpful to have like other OTs at my side. Um, Mm -hmm. There are other students outside of the students that I work with. There are other students who are like further down the line or other um, OT students. Other OT students, yeah. And I've talked to them and, and I just feel like 
kind of just talking to people and just gaining that network and them mm-hmm. knowing like, oh, she's working hard or, oh, maybe I can talk to her and, mm-hmm. and give her this idea. Or I feel like that is really helpful for me. A lot of them have really, um, I feel like they're kind of like looking out for me because I've taken that step to like get to know them and like let them know I'm eager to learn. And like, do you have any, mm-hmm. any suggestions or ideas mm-hmm. or so those are the people who have like leaned on the most. And I think this this all just kind of comes back to as a student. And again, like I put myself in this boat. I went through it as well. And I went through some very challenging experiences as a student. And I didn't really utilize my resources. And so that's why I love that we're chatting about these things and helping each other out and that you guys have already utilized some of mm-hmm. these because I think it's so important. And I do think a lot of people think, not that this is true, but they think that if I ask questions or if I'm reaching out Mm -hmm. to somebody at the school or if I'm reaching out to other people, it's a sign of weakness when Mm -hmm. it's not. People are, we're in a helping profession. People Mm -hmm. want to help. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's a sign of passion that you want to do and you want to improve and you want to get Mm -hmm. better, but you need help. Right. Yeah. You know, and yeah, you need, you need suggestions. Yeah. You need a shoulder to lean on. Mm-hmm. You, you need somebody that's going to support you and, and kind yeah. of bring you back up. Yeah. So mm-hmm. keep going with that, you know, and utilize those outside resources. Mm-hmm. Of course, that's that's so, so important. Yeah. And I wish I would have done that when yeah. I was in your mm-hmm. shoes. <laughs> it's so helpful. So I have one more question for you guys. We've, we've covered a lot of good things today and I really appreciate you guys taking the time, but so far, okay, we're five weeks in, what's been the best either day or best moment of field work so far? I think that my best moment so far has been the the moment where I got some notes returned with revisions and I realized I only had to revise half the notes that I had written the night before. <laughs> and at that moment I was just like, oh yes, I finally, like i got it a little bit, you know? (laughs) It was like a measurable sign of just like, oh, okay, here we go. 50% there. 50% there. there. (laughs) Yep. I I guess in keeping with the notes, last week, I think it was last week, towards the end of the week, my supervisor told me that one of my notes was like, great. And she's like, you really picked up on what was going on in this session. And and I was just like, what? My note? <laughs> and she like turned it in without like having to revise it. So that was, that was really nice. Felt very competent. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> well, let's, let's keep that feeling as we move forward. Yes. Um, we will, we'll do this again in two more weeks. It's crazy. Again, thank you. And I'm getting so much value out of this. And I love hearing of the stories that you guys are saying and really kind of taking the time to just break it down and hear specifically what's going on in your lives right now. So thank you. And we'll see you guys again in a couple weeks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. (laughs) Hey, before you go, I just wanted to say thanks for listening to today's episode. If you want to further the discussion, go to our website, otforlife.com, and join our Facebook group. If you like us, here are three easy ways to let us know. One, share our podcast with a friend, colleague, or anyone interested in occupational therapy. Two, leave us a review on iTunes or anywhere this podcast is found. Three, subscribe to us so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. Thanks again. We'll catch you next time, OT for Lifers. Lifers.